All right, for this week's lab, we need to download a new version of the Arduino IDE. Uh, the reason for this is it basically gives us the ability to use certain functions in the serial monitor, uh, basically serial.printf and showing floating point numbers. To download the new module for Arduino, the, the new IDE, if you go to the course website, so in the case you're going to want to go to Alex 130, or ESET 130, go down to content on my tools, and then reference material at the end. Download the zip file, extract it on your computer, and then use that executable from now on on your home computer. The labs um, will be updated to use the most recent version. I've also added in electronic component identification guides, so you guys can click on this link and check it out. It should help you guys identify parts in the labs. Once you have the Arduino software downloaded and extracted, then you can start the lab. For this week's lab, you guys are going to need to hook up a couple extra wires to your breadboard. So, on my breadboard here, I've had to add this extra orange wire, as well as I've had to add an extra ground wire connecting my Arduino to the ground rail of my breadboard. If you notice as well, for mounting this switch, the two pins that are on the same side of the switch are connected together. It's important that the two pins that are on the same side of the switch go in the same row. So if you look at my breadboard there, the pins are going across the bridge in the middle and then the orange wire is connecting pin 2 of my Arduino to the switch. Now, this wire here simply senses whether or not I'm pressing the switch or not by measuring the voltage, which means that pin 2 on the Arduino has to be made an input. If you also notice, I've added an extra resistor to the board, so this is a 10K resistor. So 10 kilo ohms. We, this is called a pull-up resistor, and what this is doing is it's limiting the current going from the power rail to ground. The reason it's doing that is when I press the switch and it makes contact, current's going to flow. This resistor must be there so you don't get a short between your power and ground rails. If you don't have a current limiting resistor in there, when you press the switch, your Arduino will shut off. You also have to connect the other side of the switch to ground so that when I press this button, rather than being 5 volts, it gets pulled down to ground. That's what the Arduino is actually detecting. It's detecting the change from 5 volts to ground or ground to 5 volts. Again, we call this a pull-up resistor, and you need to add in a wire that connects now. I have my 5-volt wire, as well as a ground wire, coming off my Arduino into the rails on my, on my breadboard. So for this lab, you need to wire up a switch in order to turn the LEDs on and off. Depending on the type of switch you use, there's two possibilities for how the contacts are configured internally. It can either be normally closed, which means that the contacts are touching all, whenever the button isn't pressed internally. In this current circuit configuration, if this switch was normally closed, meaning the contacts are touching when you're not asserting the button, when you're not pressing the button, that means that this circuit would have an active high signal. Because if the contacts are touching when you're not pressing the button, that means that the pull-up resistor here is going to get pulled down to ground the signal line here, the input to the Arduino, is going to have zero volts on it. When you press the switch, the contacts would open, and then the pull-up resistor would pull up the signal input to five volts, meaning the signal would be active high. When you activate the switch, the signal goes high. If, on the other hand, the switch you use is normally open internally, so that means that the contacts aren't normally touching, that when you press the switch, the contact close, the circuit would work in reverse, and this would be an active low circuit. So typically the signal would be 5 volts when the contacts aren't being pressed, so when the button isn't being pushed, the contacts are open, meaning you'd have 5 volts on your input signal, and then when you press the switch the contacts would close, pulling it down to ground, making the signal active low. Now, depending on the switch you use, if you use the Unimex switch that you guys have in your parts kit, the Unimix switch has both normally open and normally closed contacts in a single package, so you're free to choose which ones you'd like to use. You could also 
change the signaling from active high or active low if you reversed the wiring. So rather than having uh, the resistor connected to 5 volts, if you had the resistor connected to ground, you could also reverse how the switch operates, making a switch that's normally closed active low and a switch that's normally open active high. Depending on what switch type it is, depending on how your signal is working, whether it's active high or active low, will change how your code reacts or how your code works in the Arduino. Uh, you can do some some quick tests using the input signal and using the serial print function on the Arduino IDE to figure out whether the switch is active high or active low based on your configuration. Either will work for this lab, it's just simply a matter of you writing the correct code. After wiring up the breadboard, and installing the new Arduino IDE software on your computer so that you can use the serial monitor, the first step you should do for part two of the lab is to reload the code from last week from lab one part three where you have the three LEDs flashing on one at a time. Once you do this you should modify the code to work with the push button. In order to figure out how the push button works if you use the serial monitor, so you can open up the serial monitor in the Arduino IDE by pressing the little magnifying glass in the top right hand corner or going up to the tools menu and opening up the serial monitor there. What you can do is you can use the serial monitor to print out what the button's doing. So when you press the button you can have it print out whether it's high or low voltage based on the code you write. So you can write a little bit of test code and figure out how everything's working. Once that's done it's a fairly easy transition to the next step of the lab where you make the LEDs turn on from left to right when the button is pressed and when the button isn't pressed you make it change direction and go the other opposite way. You basically need to do, use two loops in your code to make this happen. You basically have to have a loop where it goes one direction and another loop to make it go the other way. The third part of the lab is to basically print out to the screen the number of transitions left to right and right to left that occur so that you can keep track of it. And then the very last part of the lab is to do it for a set number of times. So you have to move from left to right five times and then from right to left three times. And you must do this using two for loops. All the LEDs should be off until you press the button and then the code should also print out to the screen the number of left to right and right to left transitions. Again, if you go incrementally through the lab, each successive step should be fairly easy. It's really important, though, that you save all the code individually as three, as four different lab projects. So lab two, part one, lab two, part two, lab two, part three, lab two, part four. The reason for this is you want to be able to go back and reuse the code that's there, and you also want to make sure that you have a saved good copy of the code. Because when you are playing around with programming, you'll often end up uh, modifying your code and then it won't work properly. By ensuring that you always have a working copy, it'll make troubleshooting your code much easier, as well as you won't lose any of the work you do.